uh, it's my uh, privilege and honor to invite Professor Yuan Demen for this uh, tutorial talk at Space 2020. So uh, just to, you know, like, I mean, Professor Demen needs no mention. So, but still just to introduce formally, uh, uh, you know, like after graduating in electromechanical engineering, uh, Professor Yuan Demen was awarded his PhD in symmetric cryptography in 1995 from KU Leuven. Belgium. After his contract ended at COSIC, he privately continued his crypto research and contacted Professor Ryman Vincent to continue their collaboration that would lead to the famous Rindal block cipher that is right now standardized by NIST as, as we all know as the AES standard or the advanced encryption standard. After over 20 years of security industry experience, including work as a security architect and cryptographer for ST microelectronics, he is now a professor in the digital security group at Radboud University Nijmegen in uh, Netherlands. He co-designed the Ketchak uh, cryptographic hash function that was selected as the SHA-3 hash function standard by NIST in 2012 and is one of the founders of the permutation-based cryptography movement and uh, co-inventor of the sponge, duplex and Fairfell uh, constructions. In 2017, he won the uh, Lepchin Prize for real world cryptography for the development of AES and SHA 3. In 2018, he was awarded an ERC advanced grant for research on the foundations of security in symmetric cryptography called ESCADA and an NWO top grant for the design of symmetric cryptography in the presence of efficient multipl multipliers called scalar. So, this is a very uh, brief, I would say, summary of, you know, like of the contributions done by Yuan. And uh, I would um, rather say that, uh, uh, like on a personal note, uh, in 2008, Vincent visited us and it was a long cherished dream of us that uh, Yuan will also visit our place at IIT KGP, but it seems that we have to still wait a little bit longer. But uh, meanwhile, this is the best that we can arrange for all of you. So uh, the floor is all yours, Yuan. So. Okay. Thank you, uh, Debdeep, for this nice introduction. Uh, can you all hear me well? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, I will give a tutorial on DAC functions, and uh, DAC functions are something that um, would replace block cipher. So current uh, symmetric crypto is uh, mostly uh, defined around block ciphers, not completely, but uh, it's really very strongly block cipher oriented, and uh, this is a kind of an alternative for that. And we've presented it up to now um, more like um, permutations, but actually at the level uh, block cipher and a permutation you cannot compare, but the deck function and the block cipher you can compare. I hope it will become clear uh, during the uh, tutorial what a deck function is and how these things compare. So um, I'm giving the talk, but it basically is everything I'm, I say is joint work. Huh? Most of it is joint work um, with the, the Ketchak team which um, contained from the beginning, uh, Gilles Van Asch and Michael Peters, and somewhat later Guido Bertoni, and even later Ronnie Van Keer, and even later Seth Hoffert. And also Bart Manning has contributed to uh, quite a number of things. So uh, if you see nice figures in this presentation, it's probably made by someone else than me. But um, the uh, composition of the slides is mine. Okay, let's see, um, I have to focus, yes. Okay, so I will be uh, teaching in uh, three um, slots of one hour. That's my plan. So um, in about um, an hour or let's say 55 minutes, I should uh, take my first break. And then I, we have a break of 10 to 15 minutes. Let's see, we will announce then. And then another hour and then again a break and then the remainder of the talk which will be one, I don't know how long it will take, depends how fast it goes. So uh, you are welcome to ask questions during the presentation and uh, the questions will be moderated by Debdeep. So Debdeep will keep an eye on the questions and warn me if there is something. Okay, so this is the overview, but it doesn't, it's not really useful to discuss it now because you don't know the terms yet. So let's go immediately into the introduction. And um, I want to talk about symmetric crypto. It's about symmetric crypto and it's about 
guaranteed symmetric crypto. So in symmetric crypto, you also have hash functions. This is out of scope of this presentation. So we did a lot of work on hash functions, of course, in the catch-up team with chat three, but that is not the scope of this presentation. And um, in symmetric crypto, in key symmetric crypto, there's basically you got encryption and you have authentication. And uh, nowadays that tends to uh, come together in authenticated encryption. So that's now seen as um, the real useful uh, building block the real useful uh, cryptographic scheme, symmetric cryptographic scheme uh, that can be used in a real world is authenticated encryption. And what is authenticated encryption? Well, it's in fact the conversion of a message that contains plain text to a cryptogram where um, when Alice sends a message to Bob, she first converts it to a cryptogram and uh, Bob converts the cryptogram back to a message and access to the cryptogram does not give access to the plain text in the message. And also the cryptogram contains uh, redundancy typically a tag that does not, that prevents um, an um, intermediate party to change it. So uh, more exactly, a, a message contains a plain text that says the part that will be encrypted and some other data. And that's called associated data. And this associated data, let's say, if you have an email, huh, the plain text would be the content of the email and maybe also the subject, but the associated data would be um, the address of, um, and the, the destination, for instance, yeah? or the address of the sender, or maybe uh, some other uh, kind of metadata that you don't want to encrypt, but you still want to protect. So what is the point? Well, um, the plain text is encrypted, uh, but the both are authenticated. So the associated data and the plain text are both authenticated. So how does that work? Well, you got here this building block. That's the encryption building block. Takes the message consisting of associated data and plain text, and it converts it to a ciphertext and a tag. And this together, the ciphertext, the tag, and the associated data, we call the cryptogram. Yeah? And that will be sent over the communication line. So when you encrypt, you use a secret key. This secret key stays at Alice. And this is Bob, it also stays at Bob. So they share a symmetric key. How that is done? Well, that's key management. You can do that with public key crypto, but you can also do that with manual methods. That's out of scope. So we always assume that the key is already in place. Now, if you have a situation where Alice may encrypt multiple messages that are the same, huh? Uh, then you will get, this is a deterministic function. So that means this is fully specified deterministic function. So if you get the same input and the same key, you get the same output. And to prevent that, we have here an additional auxiliary input and that's the diversifier. And it's often called a nonce, but a nonce is more like an adjective. This should be a nonce, but by calling it nonce, it uh, kind of makes it confusing because you think it is unique, but you have to, as, as a user, as a implementer, you have to ensure it is unique. So in authenticated encryption, if you encrypt two different messages, uh, two messages that are the same at the different moments in time, under a different diversifier, you get completely different uh, cryptograms. Okay, so encryption, you take a message consisting of an associated data, plain text, and you encrypt it under a key and a diversifier, giving you uh, the cryptogram consisting of associated data that you also send, cryptogram, and the data that you send. You can also send the diversifier, but often it is a counter or it is something that can be, um, can be derived from context. For instance, if you have an IP package, it's some kind of serial number or so. Okay, and then Bob receives this, he has to present this to his decryption module, huh, to his decryption device that has the same key that requires the same diversifier and he presents all three components. So the associated data again, the cryptogram and the tag. Yeah. And if this is correct, so if this is the result of a valid encryption, you will get the plain text out. So uh, Bob will get the plain text out. If this is not valid, so if this is not the result of an encryption, you will get an error. 
Yeah. So when you get the plain text out, you know that it comes from, Bob knows it comes from Alice. Yeah. Unless the system is broken, but this is the ideal behavior. Okay, so is this, I hope this is more or less clear. So authenticate encryption allows you to encrypt a message to a cryptogram and back to a message. And it allows you to uh, uh, authenticate where it comes from. Okay. So in, if you have uh, communication, often uh, there are many messages. So let's take a look at, for instance, uh, WhatsApp or Signal. It's not like you have one message, you, you are all the time exchanging messages. So for that case, it makes sense to have uh, authenticated encryption in a session. So in a session, you got multiple messages. So here, uh, message I consists of plain text I and associated data I, and you encrypt it to cryptogram I, and the cryptogram I is again decrypted to plain text I. So you could say, ah, that's more or less the same. Well, the difference is that the tag in this cryptogram, it authenticates all cryptograms. So that means it, if the tag is here correct, it means that all previous cryptograms were correctly received. Yeah. So if you want, for instance, to send a long file, the one gigabit file or gigabyte file, and the decryption device is a lightweight device that cannot uh, store a lot of data, you can cut this file in parts and every tag says the file up to now has been received correctly. Yeah. So the point is that the tag here authenticates all that was previously sent. So from the first, message, the second message, third message. And that is implemented by having state. So you have inside the device, you've got state. Yeah. And this state basically is um, an encoding of everything that was, was sent before. And as long as it is hard to generate collisions in the state, it is a unique representation of all messages that came before. So the state is actually initialized with the key and with the diversifier. So that's session authenticated encryption. So a normal authenticated encryption, you could see as a special case of session authenticated encryption where you only have one message and then you stop. Okay, so this is the functionality we would like to realize. We would like to implement in a secure way. Is that um, understandable? I see nobody complaining, so I assume it's okay. So how are these things built? Because there are many, many authenticated encryption schemes. Take a look, for instance, at the CESAR competition, a NIST organized competition for finding uh, authenticated encryption schemes. There were, I think, over 50 submissions. And now also in the NIST lightweight uh, competition, there, are also, there were also, I think, 60 or so submissions, also all authenticated encryption schemes. So what is the typical, what was the typical way to build it, let's say a few years ago? You build it actually in two layers because building such a system in one go is kind of complicated, but if you split it into sub problems, it becomes easier. And the first sub problem is to build a block cipher, an n bit block cipher. So a block cipher is actually a permutation parameterized by a key. And um, for every key, it should be like a kind of different permutation. And if the security goal is that this permutation for someone who doesn't know the key, yeah, so let's say we got an adversary that is faced with this block cipher that is loaded with a given key, he can make queries. He should not be able to distinguish that from a random n bit permutation, where n bit is the block size of the block cipher. So he can say, yeah, encrypt me the all zero string. And he gets it back. And then he says, encrypt me uh, the all one string or encrypt me the string one, one and all zeros. And he, will, he can now make a number of queries. And then he um, has to make up his mind whether it is a random n-bit permutation selected from the space of all possible n-bit permutation or a block cipher with a given key. And um, the um, success in... Uh, in uh, distinguishing this, it's called the PRP distinguishing advantage of a block cipher. 
And the PFP distinguishing advantage is something, it's a quantity epsilon P that ranges between zero and one. So it is, uh, when it's zero, it means that block size was perfectly secure. And if it's one, it means that it's perfectly broken, completely broken. And anything in between is like, yeah, that's a measure then of security. And we assume that this advantage is small. But this advantage is not absolute. It depends on two uh, parameters, sometimes even more, but I mentioned here two. And M is the data complexity and N is the computational complexity. So M for instance is if you can query the block cipher or the permutation uh, a million times, then M is a million. And N is the amount of computation you can do. So for instance, if you have uh, a block cipher with a 64 bit key, then you can always distinguish it from a random permutation by exhaustive key search over two to the power 64 keys. And you just try all keys. You can always do that, but if, if the key size, uh, the key space is too big, it, it's not uh, feasible. And the bigger the key size, the smaller this advantage is. So there is one and one hand, there is exhaustive key search, but there is also cryptanalysis. Maybe you can break the cipher easier or with less effort than exhaustive key search. So we cannot prove, at least not up to now, we cannot prove a block cipher to be secure. So we cannot prove an upper bound on this advantage. What we can do is if we publish a block cipher, we can um, at the same time publish a claim of security. And that's, uh, we say the distinguishing advantage is not larger than, and then you give some given expression. And then it is up to cryptanalysts to uh, try to find a text that break this assumption. So the assurance of a block cipher is just based on the fact that nobody was able to break it while they tried. And so if you look at the DES, DES was published, uh, I think uh, somewhere in the 70s, 77 or so, and it increased its security reputation over the years. So in the beginning, yeah, came from more or less NSA, so why trust it? But over the years, there was more and more cryptanalysis and its reputation grew and grew until uh, the early 90s in 91, I think, or 90, when differential cryptanalysis broke this. And later linear cryptanalysis broke this again. Uh, so that was kind of a big blow for this uh, because there were actual attacks faster than exhaustive key search. For AES, we see the same happening. So we see that uh, in the beginning, there was not so much trust, but now um, about, um, let's see, AES now 22 years ago, it was uh, published, at least Reindal was published. Vincent and I published Reindal. And you could say after 22 years, there are no practical attacks, no attacks of any practical relevance. So it looks like we can trust uh, AES. So not because there is a proof of security, no, because many cryptanalysts with a lot of competence have tried to break it, but did not succeed. It's a very important thing to remember because um, provable security is now kind of more dominant in symmetric crypto, but it's always relies on a building block at the bottom. And in this case is the block cipher that we cannot prove secure, we can only um, assume it's secure and hope nobody breaks it. But as the years go on, uh, the probability that, for instance, AES will still be broken badly uh, diminishes. Okay, so what, what was done in, um, when you do a cipher, that, that what we did with AES? Well, we uh, built in some safety margins. So there was an attack when we um, designed Rheindal, we already had, there was an attack of six rounds and we just took four more rounds. Yeah? So we took kind of, uh, depending on how you look at it, 40% of the rounds of AES are safety margin. And what you see over the years is that attacks can, can get to more rounds, but in the uh, case of AES, there was not such spectacular progress over the years. Okay, so you first build an n-bit block cipher, but this n-bit block cipher, it takes a fixed length input and generates a fixed length output. It does encryption, but doesn't do authentication. Uh, so that's, we have to actually build something around that, that it allows to encrypt arbitrary length messages and authenticate arbitrary length messages, which consist of arbitrary length uh, associated data and plain text. And that we do with a mode. So we build a mode 
And we build a mode assuming we have a random permutation. Yeah? So we have as building block a permutation that is chosen from the space of all possible permutations. And then using that idealized model, if it is a well-designed mode, you can prove an upper bound for the probability of breaking this mode. So of course, you first need to also very well define what it means to break a mode. For instance, breaking a mode would be to find out something about the plain text given the ciphertext, or to do a forgery, meaning to um, generate a message that will be accepted by Bob, even if Alice didn't send it. So that's often, uh, there are definitions for this, so we don't go into detail about that. But you can actually, if you build a mode of an idealized component, you can prove an upper bound of this um, probability of breaking it. And yeah, that's possible. And that's the whole field of provable security that is concentrating on that. And then if you have this, sorry, if you have this bound, and you can make an assumption about this. So this is not proven, this red. This is just assumed, but based on cryptanalysis. And this is proven. Then you can actually, it follows immediately from that, that the probability of breaking this mode where you plug in a block cipher. So you build a mode on top of a random permutation, but you plug in the block cipher where the random permutation is, you're replaced by a block cipher. You can actually, it's, it's not a proof, it's immediate that the probability of breaking it is the sum of these terms. Yeah? And that gives you a, a kind of a, a security guarantee, where the guarantee is here, it's absolute, it's fully absolute, you have a proof. Here it's not absolute, it's built on public scrutiny. And this is also often um, referred to as the standard model. The standard assumption here is that the PRP distinguishing advantage of the block cipher is assumed to be small. Okay, so that's what we used to do. And that's really the, the, the dominant way of doing symmetric crypto. It has been, it's still uh, in many uh, places is now, and it has been like this for the past 25 years. So block cipher-based crypto is very successful, but there are a number of challenges it had to face, and they have become very apparent in the last few years. Uh, the first challenge is that the computer scientists that do these proofs, they often, they have tripped over the complexity of the modes. Yeah? So this means errors in security proofs or oversight. For instance, there was uh, just uh, uh, one year ago, a little, I think two years ago, there was a um, very remarkable thing. Uh, so there is a very famous uh, authenticated encryption mode called OCB. And there is a proof of security. But there is an instantiation of OCB called OCB2. That was the most, uh, let's say, um, the instantiation that was put forward by the authors. And it did not satisfy the conditions um, that were needed for the OCB proof to be valid. So they used certain components that did not satisfy the conditions. Um, of course, errors can uh, occur. But this error was uh, undiscovered for, uh, I think, more than 10 years. So that's a very bad thing. So we had a proof of security that was actually incorrect for OCB2. Then there have been other things like the GCM SIV uh, was a mode that was a few years ago proposed in the context of um, TLS 1.3, I think. That was the, the reason that the CFRG. And um, there were also several errors that were dismissed as typos by the authors of the proof. But the problem is that the mode is so complicated that it's hard to make uh, errorless proof. It's still possible, but it's hard. So um, another thing is the birthday bound. So actually, um, if you know the birthday paradox and uh, the fact that in uh, uh, class uh, of uh, 22, 23 people, the probability that two people have the same, two kids have the same birthday is close to a half. Well, actually you also have that when you have a block cipher based mode. Well, if the number of block cipher calls you do um, with a given key approaches the square root of the uh, possible input space of the block cipher and the possible input space has size two to the power n because uh, the block length is n 
Uh, so there are two to the power n inputs. Well, if it approaches the square root of that, and that's two to the power n over two, then security collapses. So these uh, security proofs, these, these bounds given by the security proofs, they um, uh, collapse. Then. Yeah. So is that a problem? Yeah, it is a problem for DES or triple DES that's still used a lot in the banking world nowadays, uh, because um, two to the power n over two is two to the power 32 blocks, and that's only 32 gigabytes. So it's, it's a big amount of data, but it's not, um, it's not uh, uh, unrealistically much. And uh, there have been very interesting papers written about that. I invite you to take a look at uh, this site, which uh, uh, speaks about uh, attacks that have a real world impact based on the short block length of this. For AES, it's not really a problem because it has a block length of 128 bits. So, but there, the fact that uh, you can only get security up to the two to the power 64, it stands in the way of claiming 128 bits of security. You cannot say, we achieve 128 bits of security if there is an attack that uh, after two to the power 64 queries um, uh, breaks down. So where the security breaks down. And then the third problem is that block ciphers, they don't really address the right design goals. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at modes nowadays, uh, the most of the new no modes do not make use of the inverse block cipher. So a block cipher, you can actually, it's a permutation and you can encrypt by presenting it an n-bit block and you get an n-bit block cipher text and you can decrypt that. And for that reason, you um, need to make the inverse of the block cipher efficient. But modern modes don't use it. The other thing is that a block cipher is built to be hard to distinguish from a random permutation. So that's the PRP. This SPRP, I will not go into that now, what it is. It's also, it's a variant of that, but it's still a permutation. While most modern modes, they need PRF. Uh, that is the uh, hardness to distinguish from a random function. So a permutation is invertible, a function is it. And, um, Finally, the modes are rather complex because of the fixed block length. So where in block, the block, the defining, designing a block cipher is easier than designing a mode because of the fixed block length, but also this fixed block length makes the modes complex. So for instance, if you have an input that is not a multiple of the block length, you have to do padding and that's often where it goes wrong. Okay, so there are some challenges of a block cipher based crypto and there are ways to address these challenges. Let's take a look at what a block cipher looks like. So how is it kind of built up? Huh? So a block cipher is just a permutation, an n-bit permutation, and it is parameterized by a side input. Okay, so you can see it as data coming in at the top. Huh? So the plain text, the cipher text coming out at the bottom, and on the side, you get a key coming in. So this encryption data path huh, from the top to the bottom, that's just a round function that you iterate. You do it several times and the round function by itself is weak, but if you do it multiple times, it gets surprisingly strong. And the, the, every uh, round, um, you typically add a round key and the round key is coming from a key schedule that expands the, uh, the, the user key as this red key into a sequence of round keys. And it looks like this. So where I said you go from top to bottom, actually here you go from bottom to top, but this is an existing sign. And this is the data and this is where the key goes. Okay, that's what the block cipher looks like. How can we now address these problems in these modes? Well, actually uh, several authors remarked that if you have an additional input in a block cipher, then you get all of a sudden much simpler modes. You can actually um, uh, prevent a lot of the problems of the modes using this additional input. And this additional input is called a tweak. And it was originally uh, defined, tweakable, it's called a tweakable block cipher, a block cipher with an additional input that is called a tweak. It was originally designed for um, 
memory encryption. So what is a tweakable block cipher? It's actually a permutation parameterized not only by a key, but also by a tweak. Yeah. And this W, I already said, it allows simplifying modes. And actually, the modes, it can, you can at mode level avoid the birthday bound by making this tweak unique per call. So every time you call the block cipher, you make sure that this, this tweak has a different value. There are ways to do that. Uh, the disadvantage is that you get not only a key schedule, but you get also a tweak schedule. And nowadays, there are also people that propose to combine them in one thing. It's called the tweak key schedule. So when you had originally the block cipher with one side input, now you have one with two side inputs. It's a way that works, but I'm not sure if it is the right way. Another thing we can do is just make the block cipher simpler. Yeah, we dump the side parameters. We don't add a tweak. We remove the key input. Yeah? So just a data path. Data comes in on top, comes out at the bottom. And uh, we call this bit no longer N, but we call it B. Now the birthday bound is at two to the power B divided by two. So it's actually still the same as with the block cipher, but we just rename N to B. But there is a big difference. If you have to implement the block cipher, you have to implement the data path, but also the key schedule. And together, they take more size than just N. So now this size, it becomes available for the all bits of the data path. So where, uh, let's say, if you have a block cipher with block size 128 uh, and uh, a key size of 128, like AES 128, then uh, with the same resources, you can now build a permutation of 256 bits. And with 256 bits, the birthday bound is at 2 to the power 128. And it's no longer a problem, because that's really an astronomical number. Of course, if there is no key input, you have to deal with the key one layer up. And uh, so we like to represent this, uh, our uh, uh, permutation with this sign, no side inputs. So you get high speed. Okay, so, but how are we gonna use these permutations? Well, instead of having a two layer approach, like for block sites, we have a three layer approach. First, we build a permutation app. Um, yeah, the conditions for this permutation, it, I hope it will become clear later during the presentation. It's uh, kind of similar to building a block cipher, but uh, we don't have a key schedule. That's the difference. And we do not use this permutation as such, but we first build, we construct another primitive on top of the permutation. This primitive that we indicate by fk. Yeah? It's like our block cipher was indicated by dk. We got something similar, something with a key on top of it. This primitive, we like it to have arbitrary length input and arbitrary length output. Uh, so you can present it a string of a gigabyte or one byte or um, uh, a megabyte, any, any length goes. And you can ask it um, output of any length. So, so very unlike a block cipher where the input and the output length are fixed. Yeah? Here this arbitrary. And the goal is that this FK should be hard to distinguish from a random oracle. So a random oracle is a theoretical concept that um, is a function, a deterministic function that generates when it's presented two times the same input gives two times the same output, but it will always give completely random outputs for different inputs. Yeah? Even if you have two inputs that are differ only in a single bit, you will get outputs that are completely unrelated. So that means that if you have for a random oracle the output corresponding to a high number of inputs, and then you're asked what would be the output corresponding to this new input, you would not be able to predict. So FK should be hard to distinguish from a random oracle, again, quantified by a bound on the distinguishing advantage. So we have this epsilon again. And how are we going to know whether our function fk will be OK? Well, it's going to be based uh, on public scrutiny. So where a block cipher, you cannot prove it's secure. You can only base it on public scrutiny. Also, this, this primitive will be uh, the basis for public scrutiny. It's not the permutation that's public scrutiny. No, it is this primitive. 
Yeah? Very important. So the equivalent in permutation-based crypto or DAC function-based crypto of the block cipher is this thing, this FK, and is not the permutation. This is just a building block of this. You can actually see in the block cipher there are also permutations that are building blocks, like the round function is a permutation, and the key schedule often is also invertible. Okay, so first step, build a permutation. Two step, second step, we build a new kind of primitive. That will be the subject of public scrutiny. Third step, we build a mode of a random oracle. Yeah? And often, if you use a random oracle as input, it's so strong that proving the security is almost trivial. Yeah? We have actually, we are currently in the process of doing that. We have most effort spent on um, uh, formalizing the ideal behavior, but then the proof for security is almost trivial. And the security of a mode of such a function, yeah, of this mode where we plug instead of the random oracle, we plug this FK, is again the sum of these two um, probabilities. This is the probability that you would be able to break given some resources, M and N, so the number of the data complexity or the number of queries you can do and the computational complexity or the number of computations you can do, the probability that you can break the mode with a random oracle. And this is the um, advantage, uh, the claimed advantage of distinguishing FK from a random oracle. This is proven, this is claimed. So we see actually it's the same as a block cipher based mode, except instead of having here at this level a block cipher, we now have this function FK. And this function FK, that's a deck function. So this is a deck function. So the deck function takes the place of the block cipher in permutation-based capital. Okay. Let's define it a bit more formally, how we as Ketchak team uh, see the deck function. The deck function, deck stands for doubly extendable cryptographic keyed function. Now, it's a bit strange this order, but that's also to make it match with the letters. Huh? You see deck. Um, it takes as input not one string, it takes as input a sequence of strings. Yeah? So each of these xi is a string. So this means this fk will absorb first x1, then x2, x3, and so on up to xm. So it can be any number of strings. And um, this, uh, so the separation between the strings is used in the input. So that means if you have a string 1, 1, followed by a string 0, 0, that's different from a string uh, 1, followed by a string 1, 0, 0. So these limitations, they play a role in uh, the output. So this is the function. In principle, this function generates an output of arbitrary length. So we indicate in our notation how many bits we use by adding it always to something. So this is a bitwise addition. And this, we add it to a string of n zeros. So this means we take here n bits of the output. And so we absorb in the DAC function this sequence of strings, and we take n bits out. And this means we don't take the first n bits, but we first skip the first q bits and we take them n bits. So that's the notation. And this you can see as this represents the output of the function, and this represents the right shift, uh, left shift, sorry. And you shift out the first bits, and then you take the n first bits of it. So it's a bit of strange notation, but for us, that's been very useful. Yeah, so the input is a sequence of strings. The output is potentially output uh, 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 infinite, and it's n bits starting from offset q. So it's pseudo-random. So that means for two different inputs, you get completely unrelated outputs. And uh, that is not proven. That is claimed. So that's like behavior like a random oracle. So this is the interface. And so this is the interface of the function. But we have also two more uh, requirements on the behavior. First of all, it should be efficiently incremental on the input, which means that if you first compute fk of x of a string, and then you compute fk of x followed by y, to process this y, it comes at a cost independent of x. Yeah? And that for each sequence. So that means you kind of keep state 
and you can just uh, stop the computation at some point and continue later, and you don't have to reiterate the beginning. Extendable output is similar. Um, if you request a number of bits from the offset zero, then later you can request uh, some more bits from offset n1. So you are just interrupting you. I mean, there are a couple of questions which maybe okay. you would like to take, take here. That's good point. Yes, yes. So, yeah. So one question is like, uh, why proving with RO is easier to prove with PRP or PRF? Sorry? Uh, there is a question which says uh, in the Zoom chat, which says like, why proving with random oracles easier to prove with PRP or PRF? Um, yeah, I will give. Uh, I will show you the examples later. I think that becomes clear. So the problem is, let's like, take a look at uh, counter mode. Uh, in counter mode, um, you uh, basically take a block cipher and you present it with a sequence of with a counter. So first, the first key stream is generated with counter one. Then the second key stream block is presented with counter two, and so on. So if you, um, the ideal uh, for a counter mode encryption is also a random oracle. So you should generate an output stream that is uniform. But if you um, do counter mode, let's say with uh, DES, um, you will start noticing after you've done uh, two to the power, uh, more than two to the power 32 uh, blocks like that, you will not have two times the same 64 bit block because it's a permutation and that's PRP. Uh, if you would have a PRF, you would have uh, collisions. And in um, a random oracle, you would also have collisions. So the absence of collisions there puts a limit on that. And that you start noticing after uh, when you reach the birthday bound. So in the case of um, um, counter mode, it's really what you want is PRF, uh, while uh, PRP is what you got. Yeah. I don't know if that uh, gives a good example of uh, a mode where PRF is more useful than PRP. Uh, wait. Huh? Any other, what are the other questions? So uh, there is one question which says that if there is basically a lower bound on the epsilon bound, so does it indicate that uh, the, uh, the primitive is distinguishable? As as okay. No, uh, well, yeah. Uh, but a lower bound on, um, on the distinguishing advantage. Yeah, if you can uh, prove a lower bound on the distinguishing advantage, then uh, it could be that you broke the cipher. So it depends on what your lower bound is. If you can present an attack, that shows that uh, the distinguishing advantage is at least some value higher than the claim, then you've broken uh, the cipher. Yeah? So for instance, uh, if you look at the DES, um, there was a kind, there was not really a claim, but the implicit claim was that um, any attack with complexity below two to the power 55 would break DES. Um, they did not specify uh, whether this complexity um, should be uh, data or, or computation, but actually uh, linear cryptanalysis breaks this, I think it's uh, two to the power 42 or something data, or maybe even less. So that means if you have two to the power 42 blocks, um, input outputs of this, you can find the key. And that's actually kind of a proof that the distinguishing advantage is higher than a certain value, and it's higher than what was claimed. Yeah, so the claim was that it's smaller than something. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's all the questions till now. So I think okay. we can always come back later huh, during the break. Okay, so that's a DAG function. So a DAG function is something that takes as input a sequence of strings that generates as output an, in principle, indefinitely long string, where you can actually take n first bits or also first skip qubits. Okay, so how are you going to use that for stream encryption? Well, for a stream encryption, you need a short input and a long output. So this is symbolizes your DAG function. You have a key. We assume the key is already there. And you present it with a nonce. So the nonce is the input. That's here the input. 
and we actually have a plain text and we generate as much output as we have plain text. So if you have one megabyte plain text, we generate one megabyte of outputs and we just bitwise add it to the plain text and that gets the ciphertext. Is this secure? Well, it should be secure because the DAC function is hard to distinguish from a random oracle. So this is a random output. That's the mode. That's the proof. Yeah. So if you compare this to a proof for a uh, counter mode, this is much simpler than for a counter mode. Simply because in counter mode, we have a block cipher, we have to construct our output sequence by doing multiple block cipher calls. And here it's all hidden inside this function. Yeah? It's very simple. What it actually says is that the DAC function, if you give it a short input, it becomes a stream cipher yeah? and a secure stream cipher. If you have to compute a MAC, a message authentication code, well, you get a long input and a short output. It's very simple. We present the plain text as input. And uh, we generate, let's say you are asked to generate a tag of 128 bits. Well, you generate then to take the first 128 bits of the output. And that's the tag. Is this secure? Well, if a DAC function is hard to distinguish from a random oracle, this is completely random and it's very hard to predict. So it protects against forgery. Look, uh, also there's no nonce here. Yeah? Um, you can actually combine these two, of course. Yeah? So you can actually combine this stream cipher and Mac, do both of them, and you get already authenticated encryption. This is more like, uh, more sophisticated mode. This is a mode that does session authenticated encryption um, called DEXing. That's a mode we uh, built on top of a DEC function. Uh, so how does it work? Well, we initially get our key. Yeah. Our key is part of the DEC function. We always kind of keep it out of scope where the key comes from. We assume it's just there. We first absorb the nonce of the session. So that's a, a unique session identifier. This thing should be unique for each session. Then based on that, we compute already a tag. So where is this tag useful? Well, if Alice and Bob communicate, let's say Alice starts a session and Bob needs to start the same session so that they go parallel up. Huh? Bob can, Alice can generate this tag, send it to Bob and say, hey, uh, Bob, I start the session with this nonce. This is the tag. Um, and then Bob can already verify if this nonce is exactly the one that Alice used. Yeah? So they kind of have a confirmation that they start on the good footing. Then for the first um, message, A and P here, um, what Alice does is she computes uh, first the cipher tag, the, the key stream, and she computes it based on this. So she applies the deck function to this and generates as much key stream as she needs. So if this is 100 megabytes, she generates 100 megabytes of key stream. And she adds these two and that gives the ciphertext. And then she computes the tag by also absorbing this into the function and just giving the output. So you see here that the output of Kn first generates T0 and then generates the key stream to encrypt P1. That's a problem if it has overlap, but it just basically here to generate the key stream, it skips the first T bits. And once done for one block, it continues like that. So each time it will generate the um, key stream based on the input up to now and the tag based on the input up to here. Oh, sorry. Um, input up to here. So this is formalized on the next slide. You initialize the session, uh, return the startup tag. So when you insert I for a message, first you generate the key stream based on what was already absorbed. So you don't have to do this computation again. You see, this is the same input than here. You just continue generating output. So you see that the tag here and the key stream that is used to encrypt P1 to C1, it's coming from the same call to FK, but this is the first T bits and these are the, the bits after the first T bits. Then you um, append, uh, you absorb A1 and C1 into FK huh? and uh, that you use to generate the tag. Yeah? So the first T bits of that to generate the tag. Next time you encrypt, you will do the same. 
you will always skip the first T bits uh, because you use it in the previous tag and you do it. So it's very simple mode. And you would say this becomes heavier and heavier because the, this, this history becomes longer and you have to recompute. But because of the simple incrementality, you only have to compute the thing in black every time. Yeah, I see. You have to compute this. And um, yeah, that's it. So there's actually only one FK call per, uh, per um, uh, message. Is this uh, more or less clear? Is this secure? You can actually prove very easily that this is secure. The, the difficult, the tricky part is to define what is the ideal behavior that you want. And I'm not going into that. That's another object, uh, subject per se. Yeah, I'm messing with my slides here. Yeah. Okay. So I said, yeah, but um, we're getting rid of the block cipher and um, we're going to replace it by a tag function, which is much more useful. But in some applications, you really want a block encryption. But in what you actually want often is not encryption with a fixed block cipher of 128 bits, but with a flexible block cipher, a block cipher that can adapt. So let's say you got a, an email of 40 kilobytes and I would like to block encrypted. Well, then I would like to have a 40 kilobyte block cipher, a block cipher with, with 40 kilobytes. And this is actually something you can build using DEC functions. Uh, it's called something we call DEC Y block cipher, uh, but we nowadays call it double DEC. Yeah? And uh, this gives kind of the schedule. If some, uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, DES and uh, triple des, they will recognize this as a Feistel structure. So basically what we do is we take our plain text, our input to the block cipher, and we split it into a left and a right part. So how this is done, this is well specified, but it's kind of out of scope of the presentation. And then we apply, well, these, are, these functions have different names, but you can actually implement them with the same deck function. We apply our deck function to the left part, add it to the right part, then we apply our deck function to the right part and apply it to the left part. And then again, we apply again our deck function to the left part and add it to the right part. And finally, we apply our deck function to the right part and add it to the left part. So uh, something that is interesting is that you don't have to here generate a long output. You do have to generate a long output here, but not here. Uh, another thing is that there is also a tweak. And the tweak, this is a tweakable white block cipher. The tweak goes into these calls, to these calls. Yeah. But this is kind of the, the expression in formulas. And actually, the security of this is not so very hard to prove. And it was proven by Aldo Gunsing, one of the ESCADA team members of my research team, and published in um, uh, Tosk journal, uh, the fourth issue of 2019. So it was something we had been looking at for long, many years and never found the time to do it, but Aldo found the time. So we can build a block cipher, but the block cipher is not the basis. The basis is still the deck function and the block cipher is what we built from it. So with a block cipher, you can also do authenticate encryption and I've indicated that on the next slide. Okay. Uh, uh, this way, and that's uh, actually a method that was proposed by uh, Phil Rogoway, Ted Krovetz, and Wang, I don't know his first name, and to Eurocap 2015. And what you do to uh, use a wide block cipher for authenticated encryption is basically you append to the plain text some redundancy. Huh? So let's say you got a plain text of uh, 4,000 bytes, then you can append here 128 bits of zero. And you apply your DEC Y block cipher to this. So it, it, remember that the DEC Y block cipher adapts to the width of the input, and you get a ciphertext or a cryptogram, I should say, because it contains the tag. Um, and this Y block cipher takes as input the key, but also the tweak. And in the tweak, we put the associated data. So we uh, use the tweak input to input the associated data. At receiving end, um, Bob will present the cipher text to the cipher. It just computes the inverse. Huh? So you can easily see on the previous slide how to compute the inverse and then gets the output. And if this redundancy is correct, it's, that means 
that this was actually generated by Alice. And so if this redundancy is correct, it's very hard for a Eve to uh, gen compute without knowing the key to generate a ciphertext that will produce uh, a plain text with valid uh, redundancy. So, well, you can add this redundancy, but you can also have some inherent redundancy in P. Let's say P is ASCII text. Huh? So ASCII text doesn't use all the, the possible uh, byte values. And you can actually, if you have enough um, material here, you can actually here check if it's ASCII text and that also gives authentication. So those are all kinds of um, interesting features. So the message I wanna give here in this first part of the presentation is that um, it is useful to consider an alternative cryptography where you replace the block cipher by a DAC function. Uh, that you can actually build with a DAC function a lot of interesting modes. Actually, you can build everything you ever need, including even block encryption. Yeah? Um, the next part of the presentation will be on how to build a DAC function. So I think this would be a natural place to have the break. It's also three o'clock, but we started a bit earlier, but I think it's still uh, a good moment to have the break. Yeah, so I think uh, oh, um, like 50 minutes and it's I think a good point to take a break as well. Yes. So maybe there are some questions which uh, Johan you would like to take if uh, possible. So I can during the break take questions. Um, or do you want me to, to make the question answering part of the next uh, uh, lecture part? Yeah, so as you wish, uh, uh, maybe the, in the Zoom chat you can see that there are two questions, uh, you know, like ask for in the context of uh, like I think side channels, so maybe uh, yeah, would like to take them. Yeah, okay. I will I will look at the Zoom uh, chat, huh? okay. and I will just uh, try to answer the questions by talking. Okay. Okay. So uh, we go on at fifteen ten or fifteen fifteen. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I have different time here. Huh? What time is it now again in uh, India? Yeah, India. It's now se uh, seven thirty two. So. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we can take maybe uh, a break here at uh, continue maybe after 15 minutes. Right? Yeah. So that would be like, uh, we, we continue maybe say from uh, uh, 7. 7.45? Uh, seven, uh, if we take a 15 minutes break, that would be 7.50. Okay, 7.50. Yeah, it's fine, 7.50. Okay, in the meanwhile, I will try to answer the questions, but just by talking, I'm not gonna type them in that. Right, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, can a deterministic authenticate encryption scheme be built on top of DAC functions? I'm thinking here about security guarantees equivalent to those offered by, actually, this is what I, the slide I have opened now, huh? slide 19, that's really robust authenticated encryption. This is deterministic. Anything actually that I present is deterministic. Yeah? So the only thing is that um, you can put in the diversifier or in the nonce, you can put maybe something random, but the, the function itself is deterministic. And this thing, that is fully deterministic. Yeah. This is typically what they mean by SIV. So if in this case, you have the same key and the same associated data. You see there is no nonce here. The same associated data, different plain text will give rise to different, completely different ciphertext. If you have the same plain text, the same key and the same associated data, well, then you get the same ciphertext. That's, that's always the case. So there is no randomness hidden inside in any of the schemes I presented up to now. There's also no randomness hidden inside the block cipher. So that's not different between a DAC function and a block cipher. Um, let's see. Then, yeah. Is the addition of the increasing function calculation affect the time rate of encryptions? If yes, would this time difference make the functions open to a side channel attack? Yes, so side channel um, timing, 
No. So I think timing, we just uh, basically, in all the constructions, we uh, base it on um, often permutations, up to now mostly permutations that uh, are bit sliced, that have um, uh, computation time that is constant, uh, constant for the number of rounds. So there is no, uh, I think there's no risk for, for timing attacks. Of course, there is risk for um, um, DPA, uh, so power analysis and uh, EMA. And that's every time you use the key. But then we have to look at the concrete construction. So up to now, the deck function is still a black box. We don't say what is inside, but that will become clear on the next uh, slides, what is inside. And there I can say more about it. So. Um, yeah, DPA, also fault attacks, of course, they are very important. Um, and there are actually two kind of flavors. One flavor is the parallel flavor, and the other is the serial flavor. And the serial flavor is easier to protect against side channel attacks and fault attacks than the parallel flavor. But the parallel flavor is much more efficient if you have enough memory. But uh, I will uh, try to go into that when I present the slides. So, uh, so I, I had one question about like, uh, if you can go back to like one slide before uh, or yeah, next one. 18? No, yeah, uh, yeah, this diagram. So I see that uh, this, uh, the, the, there are two functions here. One is H and one is G, right? So what do they like represent here? I mean, they're different. Yeah. They're two different deck, deck functions. Right? Yeah. So the security requirements on these functions are uh, um, hard to distinguish from a random oracle. And the security requirement of these functions, these outer functions, is weaker. So they should just be differentially uniform. Um, so if you uh, know AES GCM, for instance, you have this function G hash. The requirements for this is more like what, what is uh, for the function G hash. So this can be made more efficiently than these. But uh, when looking at it, when actually instantiating, we decided to use the same function for all the four because it almost makes no difference. And the additional complexity of having two um, uh, different functions doesn't outweigh, is not, um, let's say, uh, outweighed by the increase in efficiency. So you can do this a bit more efficiently than this. You can implement this a bit more efficiently than this, but it's only a small difference. Okay. And you might as well, I might as well change this slide because it's not the subject of this presentation and put here just FK, FK, FK. Okay. The only thing that you have to do is then have domain separation. So to make sure that these domains don't overlap. Mm -hmm. But that's not so difficult. Okay. The other question is like the, the ZOR on the left, right? I mean, the lower, in the lower column, I mean, the left column, uh, there is a shift in the ZOR. Right? So that is, that does it show like the ZOR is only on one part, basically? Is it like that? Uh, what this says is we don't have to XOR into this. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, if this is, let's say, uh, one megabyte, huh? mm -hmm. you have a kind of a block length. This is kind of the internal block length. This will be typically 500 bits or something. You only mm -hmm. have to add it to 500 bits and not to the rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the thing that it symbolizes. Mm -hmm. But if you want to know uh, more about this, it's good to read, uh, take a look at this paper. Okay. There are also very clear figures. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the requirements are uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, unambiguously described. I just here give, try to give the high level idea. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll now uh, discuss a bit serial deck functions. Um, so there are many ways of building a deck function, and uh, I touch on two ways to do it. That's the two ways we have been doing it with our research team. But of course, the the field is open. Eh? So like there are many ways to construct the block cipher. There are also many ways to construct the deck function, only limited by our own imagination. So um, the way we did it was with this construction. So it's actually um, derived from the sponge construction, but there's quite some differences, but still the security is closely linked to that of the sponge construction. Uh, let me try to explain its workings and then uh, discuss these references. So we have here this thing, that's a building block, that's a permutation. 
So that's a cryptographic permutation. It's like a block cipher without a key input. Yeah? And this cryptographic permutation has a certain width and that's we call B. Yeah? And um, how do we use this permutation in our key duplex object? Well, first we write into our, we have a state, a B bit state, and we write the key and we write an, what we call an IV. Yeah, that's the remaining part of the state. So let's say if the uh, B, the width of the permutation would be 1024 bits and the key would be 128 bits, this would be the remaining uh, 900, uh, wait, uh, um, what is it, uh, 1024? Yeah, about 900 bits, yeah? So it, it's not necessarily much smaller than the key. That's the thing. Then you apply the permutation to that, and then you generate output. You generate output um, corresponding to part of the state. You cannot give output to the full state. The part of the state that you can output is called the outer part, and its size is R bits, the rate. And its hidden part, so this part that you will never see at the output, it's called the um, inner part, and the size is the capacity. So the capacity plus the rate equals the width of the permutation. Um, okay, so you give output. Then you can absorb input. And what's different from sponge in this key duplex object is that you can absorb input over the full state. Where in the original sponge, you can also only in, uh, absorb input over the outer part. So the size is the rate here over the full state. And that was actually observed. We actually observed it in the catch-up team that it would be possible, but we didn't have a proof. But the first proof that this is secure was given by Bart Menning, Reza Reanitaba, and Damian Visa, Asia Crypt 2015. And then if you have absorb this, you can again apply the permutation, generate output, absorb, apply the permutation, generate output. So they actually proved that this is secure with some, uh, you can prove an upper bound on the distinguishing advantage, assuming this permutation is a random permutation. Now this permutation in practice, if you wanna implement this can never be a random permutation because it's a fixed permutation. But still, this proof indicates that it is possible. If you have a permutation that is, let's say, good enough, you can probably achieve this goal, but that can never be proven. Yeah? So this is, at the same time, the object of cryptanalysis. So a cryptanalyst will say, OK, I can choose IV. I can see Z. I can choose uh, sigma. And um, here, I take the F that is used in practice. So if you would do it, for instance, Ketchak based, this would be Ketchak F. And you can always reduce the number of rounds. You can say, okay, for cryptanalysis, we know that actually in practice, it's with Ketchak F 12 rounds, but for cryptanalysis, we use reduce it to two rounds or three rounds. Let's see what we can do. So that's also what you do with a block cipher. You consider a block cipher with a reduced number of rounds and you cryptanalyze it. So the attacker will only see this part of the input of the state but he will be able to put input over the full state. So this is the object of cryptanalysis. The proof here is assuming that this is a random permutation. But in practice, is, of course, it is never a random permutation because it's fully specified. So the bound given um, by these authors was not suitable for our uh, candidate for the Caesar competition, we, had, we needed some more refinement and we actually improved their bound. So we asked Bart to join us. So Gilles and me, we wrote a paper, a similar paper and we submitted Asia Crypt and got published two years later. So this paper gives a nice bound, this paper gives a better bound. And basically, these proofs are assuming a random permutation, but for any concrete construction, you have to plug in a real permutation and these bounds are no longer valid. But these bounds, they show what is possible. The security you can achieve. Yeah? So you should not see this, these proofs 
at the same level as the proofs of um, a mode of a deck function. Because a mode of a deck function, there you assume the deck function is a random oracle, and that's an assumption you can make. Huh? It's a, but it's still based on cryptanalysis. Here you assume f is a random permutation, but that's an assumption that will never hold. So it's a kind of different level. But still useful to have these proofs because it shows what, it, what we'd be able to do. And examples of this construction of, of um, a system that use this construction are Stro. That's something Mike Hamburg uh, defined in 2017, a kind of um, very versatile cryptographic primitive. But also Zodiac, our uh, submission to the NIST lightweight competition, and even Subterranean, um, also uh, a submission to the NIST lightweight competition that is based on very old work and is actually very competitive. So here, when you, what you see here is that when you start an object, you load the key. But this key is not stored in a fixed register. It will evolve. So the state, the key is in the state that it will evolve. Where in the block cipher, you use the key every block cipher call. Here for each permutation call, you, you use the key only once, only at the beginning. So that means if you can do here a long session every time, you can only attack in the first part of the session. Yeah? Because that's the only part where the key is processed. Later, the state will depend on everything that came in between. So in that sense, it is easier to protect against a side channel attack because the key is processed less. So take a look at the block cipher. Block cipher uses the key every time. And actually, each round uses the key. So one AES computation uses, uh, if you take 128-bit key, it uses uh, 10 times all the key bits. Well, not exactly the same key bit, but there's a lot of overlap. While this permutation, it only uses the key bit at the input, and it's immediately already being diffused. So the key is much less exposed than in a block cipher-based mode. That's actually the answer to that. For uh, fault attacks, of course, you got also vulnerability. But here you can, for instance, say, OK, we're going to use a one-time key. And we use it for one session. And every session, we use a different key by having evolved, the key involved. Then you cannot do differential attacks. Right? Because for a differential attack, you need two computations with the same key. But that's somewhat more tricky. So in any case, um, the more often you use the key, the more you expose the key. And the block cipher use the key very often, while in these modes, you only use the key at the beginning of the computation. Now, is this a DAC function? Yeah, it generates output, and you can generate indefinitely long outputs. And you can put input strings, multiple input strings, and it's also incremental. But the length of the input strings is limited. So if you have b bits, the maximum length of this is every time b bits. And the length of the output strings too, this is maximum uh, r bits. Yeah. So realistic values would be 1,024. Um, the rate, uh, the, the capacity would be like 180 or so. And this would be the remaining 800 or so bits. So it's not really a deck function per se. It's a deck function with length restricted input and output strings. Yeah? But you can easily build a thin input encoding layer on top that makes it a deck function. That's actually what we did in subterranean, and it's quite simple. So you can build a deck function from this, a very efficient deck function from this construction. So cryptanalysis, as I said, you have to plug in the real permutation and try to break it. That's the thing. But uh, most of this talk will be about the parallel because they're more, uh, let's say, efficient and then more um, versatile. How is I got a question? How do DEC functions relate to ZOF? That's a very good question. Uh, a DEC function, a ZOF is a DEC function without a key. Or a DEC function is a ZOF with a key. Um, also, in a ZOF, in principle, you don't need to support multiple input strings, but we should have done that. Looking back, we should have done that, but we didn't. We, we, we we're not aware of that. But for the rest, like interface wise, DEC function takes a key input string and generates arbitrary length output. A ZOF 
takes an input string and generates arbitrary length output. But a ZOF is also uh, efficiently incrementable in practice, at least uh, not a ZOF, but sponge based ZOFs. It's, it's a very good question, I think. Okay, so now I'll go to parallel deck functions. So if you look at this construction, you see that if you want to process this F, you need the output of the previous F. So you can, you're bound by strictly serial computation. If you have here a thousand uh, F calls, you have to do them serially. So even if you have a lot of computational resources that you could use in parallel, you cannot because of the mode. And we have been looking for a long time for parallel modes, long time, I say it started in 2010 or so. And after a number of years, we converge to something. And that are our parallel deck functions. So I repeat that this is not the only ways to do it. This is just what we did, but I invite people to do that. And um, we got our inspiration in, let's say, yeah. We got our inspiration from a bow tie, yeah, like a bow tie. And the word of bow tie in Italian is actually farfalle, and that's the same as this. So this was our inspiration for the name. And if you look at the construction, you see where it comes from. Yeah? It's called farfalle. So I don't know if there are Italians in the room, but they will get it. Uh, but I think most people will know this pasta, right? Um, and what you see here in Farfalle is, let me explain a bit. Huh? You got here a key, yeah? The key is input in many places. We got an input string. An input string is split in two blocks. So how it exactly is split is a bit out of scope. I have one slide about that later. So we split our input string into blocks. The key and the blocks of the input string have the same length. So we encode this into B bit blocks, where we have here a permutation taking a B bit block. So we got here a B bit block. Yeah. This is, let's say, some width, let's say 256 bits, and this is the remains of B. So if this is 1024, this will be 768 bits, and this 256 bits. Yeah? This part contains the message block XR with the key. Yeah? And um, we just split up, our, we first pad our message block, and then we split it up uh, our message, and then we pad it, uh, pad it, and we we do as number and um, any iterations as we need. So what is the first block look like? It's the first block of the message, XR with the key, followed by 256 bits that encode zero. So it's just all zeros. Second block, second message block with the key, with 256 bits encoding one, and so on and so on, up to all blocks. Yeah? Okay, if we have multiple strings, we need some mechanism. I will explain later how we do it now, but we did at that moment, this was 2014, we did not have that feature yet. Then we apply a permutation F to each of these blocks in parallel. So that there's the parallelism. You can actually process this before you process all of that. So that's completely parallelizable. And we just add the outputs of these blocks. So we get here 1024 bits, 1024 bits. We just add them all and we get 1024 bit block. We call this the accumulator. So, oh, sorry. Then we need to generate an arbitrary length output. So what we do is we take the output of this addition, we append the zero. So here actually, we have 1024 bits, we truncate to 768 bits and we append zero. We apply F again, then we add K and we give our output block. 
So here, the, this is the same key. And we get here 768 bits. And if we need a lot of bits, we do this many times. Yeah? And you can also do this fully in parallel. So this is fully parallelizable. This is fully parallelizable. This, of course, yeah, you have to first do all this before you can start this. So that's not parallelizable, but both phases are parallelizable. It's also incremental because you just keep state and you can do additional blocks here. So it's here also easily incremental because you can just generate new outputs. That was our early attempt. And this uh, actually uh, reminds a bit of PMAC, those who know PMAC, but actually we can go back further in time and then we end up with Dan Bernstein's uh, protected countersums. But in protected countersums, this is assumed to be a PRF, while we had in mind here a permutation with a few rounds. So like Ketchak P, the underlying permutation of the Ketchak um, hash function or Zoff uh, with a few rounds. We were thinking of four rounds or five rounds or so. Okay, that was our attempt. So it's quite, we achieve everything we want to achieve except security. We thought in the beginning this would be secure, but we were wrong. And let me explain. So what you actually can do on this construction, you can mount a higher order differential collision. So what does that look like? Well, if you compute for a given function, you compute it over an input x plus a constant v plus f of x. This is this behaves like a derivative. And we can write it like this. So this is fx derived in the direction of v. So where v is a constant. So you can actually see fx is a function in a variable x. And this is also a function in a variable. And it's kind of derivative. So you can actually derive a function uh, for any constant you derive a differential. And this constant you can see as a direction where you derive. So it's kind of like multidimensional derivative. Very interesting, but why is this important? Well, actually the algebraic degree of this function is at most the algebraic degree of f minus one. So that means if f has degree five, this has degree at most four. Yeah, and you can actually do that um, iteratively. So if you have this function, you can derive again. And this additional derivation, you can work it out. So you actually get a sum of four terms. So one derivation, two terms, two derivation, four terms, three derivations, eight terms, n derivations, two to the power n terms. And every time you derive, you decrease the degree by at least one. Hello. So I was thrown out. Is that possible? So, so you are, uh, I think we lost you for like uh, maybe one or two minutes. So, okay. I mean, yeah. we were we were at the uh, double derivative point from where we lost. Oh, yeah. You. Okay. okay. Yeah, I noticed something strange here. Yeah. Am I the, Am I still um, sharing screen? No, your screen. I think you have to share once more. Okay, I'll reshare. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, uh, something went wrong. So yeah, we can derive and deriving over a vector is basically evaluating the function in two points that have a distance this vector. And you can derive twice and deriving twice is basically doing the same operation twice and you get four elements. And if you derive D times, you get a vector space. You have to compute the sum of the outputs of the function applied to inputs that form a vector space. And that's the point. Um, if you do that, then you, um, the resulting function has an algebraic degree that is um, that of the original function minus D at most actually. So it gets decreased by D. Now, if we look at the function we had in mind here, that's a Ketchak F with a fixed, with a small number of rounds, five or six rounds, then the degree of the resulting function, this Ketchak F with a few rounds, is two to the power of the number of rounds because the Ketchak F round function has algebraic degree two. If you apply it twice, it has algebraic degree four, three times algebraic degree eight, so it doubles every time. So for instance, five rounds, it only has degree 32. Now you can actually um, compute the output over uh, a vector space of dimension 32. So that's two to the power 32 inputs and the resulting addition will have, will be the output of a function of degree um, th uh, 32 minus 32. So it will be degree one or not degree zero. And that's a constant. Yeah? So, but this addition here, it's actually happening here. That's this addition. Yeah? And we can apply these in, we can apply inputs so that these appear here. Yeah? So let's see how this would work. We can actually build from this a collision generating attack. So let's say we have F of five rounds. Yeah? Then we choose a message of two to the power two to the power five blocks. Yeah? That would be two to the power 32 blocks. That's a lot, but it's not like uh, uh, unrealistically many. So a message of two to the power 32 blocks. And we make sure this vec these blocks form a vector space. Well, this addition of the key, it moves the vector space to an affine space, but it's still valid. So it doesn't help. And also these encodings of these numbers, we use the very simple encoding, they also form a vector space. So we have actually here the sum of applications to, of F, to input that form a vector space. So if our vector space is large enough, uh, two to the power of 32, this is a constant. So whatever we apply here, as soon as it has, um, it forms a vector space of dimension 32, it will be independent of this. So it's easy to generate collisions. No? We can even build an n-fold multi-collision. We can just generate as many inputs of this function of two to the power of 32 blocks as we want that have all the same image. Yeah. We can actually do better than that and peel off one round. So uh, you don't, if you have here five rounds, you only need to consider a message of two to the power of 16 blocks, it turned out. So analyzing this is actually, these attacks are practical up to six rounds. So we need to take for F six rounds and even if we take this function f six rounds, we can uh, generate a collision um, with 0 0.5 terabyte messages. So that's a big message, but it's still, it's feasible. So that was very bad. And that's a weakness that is only dependent on this part. And it's based on the fact that we here apply the XOR, and it's based on the fact that we actually here have an encoding of these numbers that are, uh, forms a vector space by itself. So you can try it out for yourself, the encodings of zero up to 15 
how that forms a nice vector space, and the fact that here you have a constant. So we want had to fix this problem because maybe we could say, yeah, we take eight rounds, that will be okay, but these attacks can also get better. Huh? So we have this reduction here that could maybe be done again. So we try to find a more fundamental solution. Arm mitigation. So instead of computing the input to F for block I as the message block with the key added to it, with a fixed key added to it, and then concatenated with an encoding of um, the block number, we decided to do the following. We add to the message block M, we consider it actually as a vector, but uh, as a polynomial. We add the polynomial x to the power i times kx modulo px, where well, this is the key. And this is an irreducible polynomial. And this is um, yeah, x to the power i. So those who, of you who know about linear feedback shift registers, this is just the content of the linear feedback shift register which you initialize with the key after i iterations. So we actually did not get this immediately. This took us, I think, a few years to converge to this. Not that we were working full time on it, but uh, it took a long time. And we call this input mask rolling. Well, actually, this is the input mask. The input mask is initialized to kx, and then every time we multiply by x. And we now take a key that has the same length as the message, and then they both have the width of the permutation. Yeah? Now we can, in the paper um, on um, Farfalle, I think, we have given evidence that if this polynomial is not sparse, so it contains a lot of terms, it's not a trinomial or a pentanomial, then it's very hard to choose these m, i, to form an exploitable affine space. And so it's still possible, but it's, it requires a huge amount of blocks, really like an uh, astronomical amount of blocks. I've shown that. Okay, I'm not going into that in the detail. Uh, the benefit is that it is actually, it also increases the rate of the blocks to the full width. And the resulting construction is this. So it kind of gets <clears throat> a little less elegant. So instead of taking here the message blocks as input, add it with a fixed key, we let this key evolve. So initially, the, 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 we call this the mask. And this mask is computed from the user key by intervention of a permutation. We have actually different permutations, but in practice, we try to implement them with the same one. So we first take the user key, which can be 128 bits, for instance. We append um, a one and zeros, uh, invertible padding, and we present it to the permutation. And this gives us a B bit key. So this 1024 bit key in my example all the time. And we add this key to the first message block. Then we add this key. Then we iterate this linear feedback shift register. And the iterated version we add to the second block, and so on and so on. So you see that, and then we apply the result to the permutation. We call this PC, PB, PC, PD, PE. Now, these PCs, they can all be done in parallel. But you see here, there's a serial dependence. We can only compute each key. Well. It's kind of depicted that it's not serial, but it's I iterations. We typically do this in a serial fashion. But this can be pre-computed because this key, this mask is independent of the message. Yeah? And it's also a very lightweight function. So we chosen for a function uh, that is very easy to evaluate. So you see here also, this key is used once. This key is used often, uh, but it's evolving. So, but still, uh, this is worse than the serial uh, deck function. The serial deck function, you use the key much less than here. Here you use for each block, you use the key. Okay, then the rest is here, it's the same, but there is an additional step that this PD, I will explain later where that comes from on the next slide. Um, 
so then to generate the output, we do a similar technique. We, instead of taking this state truncating and adding a constant, we let it also run through this linear feedback shift register. Uh, so we just take the state as such, we apply PE, we add key prime, that's the key you would obtain here. So the key that you have here. Um, and you give an output and so on and so on. So these are now B bits instead of not fully B bits. And uh, we have, in fact, one, oh, one, two, three, four permutations. But in practice, we try to implement it with the same permutation. So why, do, uh, why don't uh, the, why don't you have any like i plus one shifts like I see from i to i plus two, right? Um, yeah, this i plus two that follows that becomes clear later. Okay. Yeah. So this here at i we make a jump and then we go immediately to i plus two and that's the one we get here. Hmm. There's a kind of logic in there, but I will try to explain on the next slide. So this is the final construction. It doesn't give all details, but uh, this is what it is. I already kind of explained it. Huh? So we have first derivation of the mask from the user key using PV. Then we got here linear input mask rolling. And so this is basically linear feedback shift register, which we implement in a way also inspired by other people. It's not that we invented that ourselves. We apply the, uh, this permutation to all blocks, resulting blocks in parallel. We add them. We apply PD, which I will show on the next slide. And then we expand again, and we do here also state rolling. This state rolling, we had also a linear function, but then there was an attack by a French team um, when we submitted to TOSC, and we had to replace this by a nonlinear function. Am I still uh, in the call? Yeah. So uh, oh, yeah, there is a question. Yeah. So there is a question. Yeah, so there, there is a question, John. Would you probably like to take? Like uh, the question is like, why use PRPs as building blocks instead of PRFs? Um, so there are no PFPs. These are permutations. They are just fixed permutations with a small number of rounds. So it's not PFPs. It's um, it's permutations. They don't have these permutations. They don't have the ambition to be secure. So the whole thing is that this whole thing should be secure. So this is actually the object of cryptanalysis. Um, so we get an, I will show you a bit what are the top possible attacks. Huh? Um, so the attacker gets to choose this input, doesn't see this, and gets to see this output. And we have to choose our functions here so that the attacker cannot distinguish this from a random oracle. And we don't make assumptions about these. These are concrete functions. So for instance, for Kravata, that's our um, Ketchak based instance, we put here Ketchak F1600 with six rounds. It's uh, not, this is not proven secure. You cannot actually prove this secure. You can, you could make in principle a proof of the construction based on random permutation. But um, it's not PFP. These things are permutations. Yeah. So you should see this at the same level as a block cipher or a tweakable block cipher. The adversary gets query access to input, it gets to see the output, doesn't know what the key is, and has to distinguish from a random model. Now, you may ask the question does it have to be a permutation? It does not have to be a permutation. It could be uh, a function that is not invertible, but you cannot afford a lot of, um, how should I say? Cannot uh, afford a lot of collisions. So, but if you have very limited amount of collisions in these functions, you can actually build something secure. But these are not, to be not understood as these are PRPs or PRF or anything. These are fixed permutations. Yeah. Okay, so you got three types of attack. One type of attack is an attack that only considers input and tries to generate a collision here. Yeah? If you can find two different inputs that generate a collision here, then these inputs will generate exactly the same output. 
And that's something that a uh, random oracle doesn't do, generate the same output. Well, at least not if you generate a very long output. And you can generate a very long output. You can go on forever here. Yeah? So that's collision generating attacks. And there we already have quite some, uh, made some progress in uh, crypto analysis in, in the team in Nainu. So we have really a, getting a very good understanding of this way of generating collisions here. The second type of attack is an attack that does state recovery. So what you basically try to do is you try to recover the output of PD here. These are actually all the same value um, uh, by looking at the output. Yeah? So the first attack is independent of this part. This attack of generating, uh, reconstructing the key here, uh, the state here is independent of this part. Yeah? So these are two attacks that you cannot do on the block side. On the block side, you always have to consider input output. So collision generating attacks and attacks that only consider the output. The, all other attacks, they have to consider input and output. But attacks from input to output, they have to go through one, two, three layers of uh, permutation. So it's basically the, the composition of PE, PD, and PC. Now, there was such an attack that we did not think of, but actually Jill, uh, my colleague Jill, thought of it at some point. And that we call the accumulator affine space attack. And it's an attack that's actually independent of this part. Yeah? We were kind of surprised, but in retrospect, it's quite easy to understand what this attack is doing. So it's an attack that only relies on this part, but still uses input and output. And let me explain it on the next slide, because this is the attack that makes this thing to be present. If we wouldn't have had this attack, this wouldn't be there. OK. Let's take our function, and let's compute our function for four different messages. These messages have all two blocks input. So it stops here. So they have only two blocks input. And the first message has M0, M1 for any value of M0 and M1. The second message has M0 prime and M1. So it's different in the first block, but the same in the second block. The third message is M0, M1 prime. So it's the same in the first block as this one but different in the second block, but it's actually yeah different in the second block. And then we get M0 prime, M1 prime. Yeah. So basically, we apply M0 in this message and in this message, M0 prime in this message and in this message, and M1 in these two messages, M1 prime in these two messages. But these are four messages, or two to the power of two. Now let's take a look at what happens here. Yeah? So the output of these, we call this EAI. Yeah? So we have here A0, A1. Um, and AI prime is the same for the, the, the values with the prime. So AI yeah, is actually PC applied to M. So A0 is equal to PC applied to M0 plus K, K0. And AI prime is PC applied to MI prime plus KI. So this is the same, this is different. Um, actually, this leads to an affine space in the accumulator. So we have here an affine space for these four messages. Namely, for the first message, we get A0 plus A1. For the second message, we get A0 prime plus A1. The third message, we get A0 plus A1 prime. And the fourth, we get A0 prime plus A1. So for these four messages, the intermediate values here in the accumulator form an affine space. And you can actually generalize this to dimension D. And then you get here a, a D dimensional space. Huh? So it's easy to generalize. You take just three block messages, you have eight of them. 
and you get an affine space of dimension eight, so you can generalize. And then that means that for this affine space, if you sum all the outputs, if this degree is low enough, you will be able to distinguish because it will be constant. Yeah? So what we need is this and this to have low degree, uh, high degree. If it has too low degree, it should be higher. So that means if we don't have this present here, then we need to take a lot of rounds here. That's the problem. Eight rounds or so. But that would be very expensive because you do this for every block. So we said, okay, let's add this. And then we can keep this cheap and nice and light. And we just do this not so much. So this you do a lot of this computation, do a lot of it. This you just do rarely. Yeah? So that was the reason to add this uh, PD, this attack. Okay, so now this multi string input, how does that work? Well, this is more detail. Let's say we have input two strings, A and B. What we first do is we pad A to a multiple of the block length. Uh, so the block length is 1024 bits. We add a one and sufficiently number of zeros so that it's a whole number of blocks. So note that if this is 1024 bits, you will go to two blocks. It will expand to two blocks. If it's 1023 bits, it doesn't expand to two blocks, it just stays one block. So we do the same with all our input strings. So we got here, in this case, three blocks, here two blocks. Then we just apply them. This is just a standard application. Eh? So we had here A0, K0, PC. A1, K1, PC. A2, K2, PC. When we start a new block, we actually do a blank iteration. That's the trick. So we do, instead of only one to the next block, we do two of them. That's the trick. So that's very cheap because this is a very cheap operation. So we get, uh, this doesn't cost a PC, it just costs an additional iteration of the rolling function. That's very cheap. So that's a way to do it. That's the way we did it. So this allows us to put borders between different input messages. And this also explains where this i plus two comes from because that would be the next one. Yeah, that's seven and that's what happens here. So here would be seven and that goes here. This seven is exactly the same k that we will get when we continue here. So this saves some memory. You don't need to store two values. Okay. Um, Zuru and Zuru. I think, uh, uh, Jan, I mean, uh, as we discussed, right, maybe it is a good point to take a 15 minutes break. Yeah, that's and... a good point. I fully agree. We started with saying, uh, yeah, that's how we build things now with block ciphers um, and I propose an alternative approach where we replace the role of a block cipher by a function with not fixed length, but with variable length input and output that is not tries to mimic it does not try to mimic a random permutation, but tries to mimic a random function or a random oracle uh, with a variable length input and output. And uh, we saw a number of um, sort of definition and a number of modes where I try to convince you that you can do actually anything you would ever want to do in Keith symmetric crypto with a DAC function. And I discussed a bit how to build a DAC function in a serial way based on sponge basically, but a variant called duplex, full state key duplex, as we used to call it in the beginning. And then I quickly went to the parallel version, which is Farfalle. And I tried to explain a bit of the evolution from what we were thinking in the beginning to what we ended up with. And that forms the object of cryptanalysis, but it's also a building block for things. But I have not looked into what is this F or this P, P, uh, B, PC, PD, PE, what are these permutations? And that's where we will go now. And I will explain a bit uh, what that leads to. So the sort of permutation is something we um, <clears throat> first um, communicated to the world at the ECC conference here in Nijmegen, um, where uh, I had the pleasure to give an invited talk. So that's now three years ago. It was in November, 2017. And this work of the Zulu permutation was actually triggered by another uh, work, namely the Gimli permutation, 
that was designed earlier that year. Um, no, it was designed the year before, but published uh, earlier that year by a big team of designers. So 11 people, they could form a uh, soccer team. And this Gimli, what is interesting about Gimli? Well, is actually um, a permutation that is efficient on a wide range of platforms. And it says 384 bits. So 384 doesn't look like a round number, but it's actually three times 128. And what is nice about it is that it's uh, efficient on low end CPUs, like for instance, ARM Cortex, M0, M3, M4, because on M0, M3, and M4, this state fits the register. So you get 16 registers of 32 bits, of which 14 you can freely use. And it fits, the state actually fits in 12 registers of 32 bits. But on the high end, it's also suitable for SIMD instructions. So that the ones you got on Intel um, uh, high end CPUs, but also on uh, AMD. So it's something that is really efficient on a wide range of platforms. Problem with Gimli we were already looking at Farfalle then, is that it's not really suited for Farfalle because there we like to have good bounds. So I'll try to explain later what I mean by good bounds. So it's not provable bounds of security, but it's bounds on propagation properties. So the idea of Gimli, this size that it is efficient on a wide range of platforms, that's really appealed to us, but the actual uh, building blocks, the computational building blocks of Gimli did much less so. So we decided to make our own kind of Gimli permutation, Gimli-like permutation, we called it Zudu. And Zudu, it has the same kind of state. So it's a 384-bit permutation uh, that is kind of structured as 12 words of 32 bits. We call them lanes. But the building blocks of the round function are very similar to those of Ketchak F, so the permutation underlying Ketchak. And up to 2017, we had actually concentrated all our efforts since 2008 to the Ketchak F permutation. And this was for us a big step to go to another permutation. Um, and we actually learned from uh, our analysis of the Ketchak F permutation to improve. And this Zudu is kind of an improvement of Ketchak F. So I will try to explain in a few slides how Zudu, how it works. So it operates on a state of 384 bits. And these 384 bits are structured in a three-dimensional array, an array of three, three layers. And each layer is called a plane. A plane is four bits wide and 32 bits deep. So this is not really a representation. This is just a toy version with eight bits, but it's actually 32 bits. Um, and um, so we got three of these planes. Yeah. Um, for my explanation here, I don't need to explain more than this. So you got three planes and each the bits in a given position corresponding to the three different planes is called a column. And so columns are basically one dimensional subarrays of the state that are orthogonal to the plane. Three bit columns, 128 bit planes. And our uh, round function is expressed in terms of these things. So let's go to the next slide. So the Zulu round function has similarly to the Ketchakev round function, five steps. So the, des, the AES round function only has four steps. So that's not a big deal. It's not a big difference, but yeah, just so you know. So every round function should have a nonlinear step. And in um, Zulu, this nonlinear step is working as follows. First, we take, these are the planes, A0, A1, and A2. Yeah? So first we complement A1, and um, we take the bitwise end with A2. Yeah? And that we call B0. And we do similar in a circular fashion. So B1, we compute by complementing A2, and bitwise product with A0. So this is an end, yeah? bitwise end. And B2, we do the same with A0 and A1. And then we just add to A0, we add B0, A1, we add B1, and A2, we add B2. 
quite simple. These are very simple, efficient operations that um, uh, have low computational cost. And what they do is they mix bits that are in corresponding positions. Huh? So you just take the whole plane and you combine them. So you can see it as three bit S boxes operating on columns. So if you have here state, we have actually 128 S boxes operating in parallel on the columns. It's a very simple S box. It's key is actually um, similar mapping than we use in Ketchakat for the nonlinear mapping, but also subterranean, many of my earlier designs. It has algebraic degree too. So this is just nonlinear and it doesn't do any mixing. So that means in the columns, you just stay, the bits only mix inside the columns. And also the mixing is not so strong. So we need some more mixing. And therefore that we have a mix layer. Um, and it's actually done before C. Yeah, and it's called theta. It's called, we call it a column parity mixer. So why is it called column parity mixer? Well, first we add the three planes. Yeah? This is bitwise addition. So basically for each column, we add the three bits of the column and we write it in the corresponding bit position in P. So that's the parity plane. It's one plane. Um, and this parity plane, we do some operations on it. We shift it. Yeah. We shift it over a vector 1,5 and we shift it over a vector 1,40. So what, how should you see this shift? Well, if you have a plane shifting, it's over a certain vector. So if you point a vector here, you will shift it there. So then part of the bits will fall outside and they will come back from the other side. So it's kind of circular shift, yeah? cyclic shift in two dimensions. So we compute the parity, we do a cyclic shift, we do a duplication cyclic shift, and then this result we add to all three planes. So this does a lot of mix, very good mixing function actually, but it's also very column oriented huh? because this, these bits of P, they are the sum of the bits of a column. So we got here mixing kind of inside the columns, we got here Nonlinear mapping inside the column. So we need to do something to tear these columns apart. And for that, we put between rho and chi, we shift plane one and we shift plane two over two different offsets. So I can go again back here. So we take our plane zero, that's the bottom plane. We stay, keep it where it is. This plane on one, we shift it over one direction. This we shift over another direction. And the three bits that are in the same column, they will go to different columns. And the bits that will end up in the same column, they come from different columns. So we kind of break the column alignment here. Yeah? But if we have multiple rounds, so we do this multiple times in a loop, then we see that if we have chi and then immediately following theta, we have still this strong column alignment. So we need to do similar stuff here. So we, that's why we have two um, bit shuffles. These shuffle the bits. Yeah? So one to destroy column alignment after theta before chi, and one to destroy column alignment after chi before the next theta. That's basically the round function. The only thing that's missing is a round constant addition because there's a lot of symmetry here and we need to destroy that symmetry and that we do by adding some bits. It's quite a simple round function and it has very good propagation properties. Um, these propagation properties, they are described in the trail bounds. So trail bounds, trails are things that have relevance in the attacks, differential and linear cryptonauts. And these are the kind of defining attacks of symmetric crypto, if you ask me. Very important attacks that say a lot about other attacks too. They kind of are describing the worst case propagation, the best that um, an adversary can exploit. So what is relevant in differential crypt analysis is the differential propagation probability of inputs to outputs. What does that mean? So if we consider a random pair of inputs to the permutation with a certain difference, yeah, so we apply two inputs that are randomly chosen in such a way that they still they have a fixed difference. So you basically choose one of the inputs and you compute the other one by adding 
delta n. Then the probability that we give a, give a certain delta out, huh, that the output of the permutation, the difference between the two outputs is delta out, we actually want this compute to know the maximum of all possible delta in delta out. And the higher this is, the more efficient differential cryptanalysis is, or the worse the uh, cipher behaves with respect to differential cryptanalysis. So we want this maximum of all delta in delta out to be small. With uh, linear cryptanalysis, we're looking at correlations. We want the maximum correlation of all input bits and all possible combination of input bits denoted by u in, and all possible combination of output bits u out. So the maximum of all these possible combinations to be as small as possible. But these are very hard to compute these things. But in Zulu, we claim that this is very well approximated by this. Okay. Where here you look over a differential, an input and an output difference, and here we look over a differential trail. So what is a differential trail? Well, if you have a number of rounds of a, of a iterated permutation, like a block cipher or like a permutation, like Zulu in this case, you not only specify the input difference and the output difference, but you also specify the intermediate differences. Yeah. So the advantage of this is that it's easier to get bounds than for this. And for Zulu, we have some circumstantial evidence that this is really a very good approximation. So it doesn't really matter that this is hard to compute. We just compute this and it's really representative. For linear cryptanalysis, we have something similar with linear trails. I will not go into this. And then finally, to make things easier to uh, visualize and understand, we replace the DP, that's often of the form two to the power minus something, by the weight. So if we have a DP two to the power minus X, the weight becomes X. That's that we don't have in tables all these uh, two to the power minus expressions, but we can just give the weight. So those are trail bounds. And we actually have upper bounds on the weight of trails over a limited number of rounds. And that's in this table. So to show you that we actually made progress uh, with respect to Ketchak F that was designed in 2007, 2008, uh, I compared to Ketchak F. So I could have compared to other um, competing proposals, but I will leave that as an exercise for yourself. You can check the papers. In many cases, you will not find uh, linear trail bounds because the people uh, have a hard time um, investigating linear trails. Well, Ketchakev is in fact uh, very simple. So what does this table say? This is for differential trails. This is for linear trails. Yeah? And this is the number of rounds. So what this says, for instance, that for three rounds, for Ketchakev 400, so that's the Ketchakev version that has a permutation with 400 bits, very close to Zulu, which is 384 bits. So that's the version we should compare. You have a three round trail of weight 24. That means there is a three round trail with probability two to the power minus 24, DP to the power minus 24. That also means that there is a three round differential, and we know this is for differentials, with a mark with dp two to the power minus 24. Same for a linear trail. So we got a three round trail with also a correlation to the power minus, well, square correlation to the power minus 24. For Zulu, it's actually 50% better. So the best three round linear trail has. Um, as a differential probability to the power minus 36. So that's a, actually a factor two to the power 12 better. Huh? If you look at the weight, it's just 50% better. But if you look at the actual DP, it's the exponent of that. It's two to the power exponent of that. So it's two to the power 12 less than Ketchak. Huh? You see, so we're already three rounds. The three rounds is not really given, doesn't give good security. You really need to do more rounds. So if you look at four rounds, well, there actually, we don't have um, the tight bounds. These bounds are really tight. But starting from four rounds, our bounds are no longer tight. 
So for KHK 400, we know that there are no differential trails with weight below 48. So that means that for KHK 400, there are no differential trails with probability with DP above two to the power minus 40. And we know also that we have a trail of weight 63. So we know that it is somewhere in this interval, yeah? the bound. Well, currently this is the bound, but it's not tight, but it's somewhere in between. For Zulu, we have a similar problem. We don't have a tight bound, but it's a smaller interval. And what you also can see is that the worst case for Zulu is still a factor two to the power nine, two to the power 11 better than the best case for Ketchakat. So it's really much better. And we actually believe that this is 80, that it's the trail we found. We found the number of trails with weight 80, that those are the best. So for four rounds, we have here quite, also quite better huh, than Ketchak. You see the similar thing with linear trails, where actually Ketchak does even a bit worse, and Zulu does this, has the same performance here. If you go up, so for five, you see a big difference. Here it's even two times better. Here it's yeah, almost two times better, and so on and so on. So you see for six rounds, you got quite an impressive, um, uh, uh, quite impressive bound. If you look up the similar um, bounds for Gimli, you will see that you have to go to really many, many, many more rounds to get this kind of stuff. And for linear trails, they have actually nothing in their paper, but there have been other people investigating. But it's not, I'm not only one I compare to Gimli. You see that for many permutations, if you compare them with, Ket, with Zulu, you get really good bounds. And the round function is really light. Uh, this uh, work was done, um, so the work on Ketchakev for differential trades was done by uh, Sylvia Mella, accompanied by uh, Gilles Van Asch and myself. Then this work on linear trades was done by Mil Sylvia Mella on her own, still unpublished, so she will, uh, I hope, publish it soon. And this Zudu was done by Ketchakev, it was mostly executed by uh, Gilles. Okay. So yeah, just to say that Zulu is kind of an improved version of Ketchak F and Ketchak F, there went a lot of effort into it, but Zulu, we learned a lot from analyzing Ketchak F and we did that. So if we plug in Zulu in for Fale, we get Zoof. So why is the name Zoof? Well, it kind of suggests speed, eh? well, that's Zoof, you know, that's the idea. So you get the same construction. And what we basically do is we plug in Zulu with six rounds here, 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 and here. So in all four cases, we plug in Zulu with six rounds. We made a dedicated linear feedback shift register here, and we made a dedicated nonlinear feedback shift register. Um, yeah, this is the subject of chip analysis. So we hope people will attack it. We already attack it and we get more and more insight in how it works and where its security limits are. And uh, we claim the following bound, this kind of simplification, but there are many there are more terms, but these are the dominant terms. So the bound is here, the, day, the computational complexity divided by two to the power, okay? So two to the power, the length of the key. So this term corresponds to exhaustive key search. So when you do exhaustive key search, um, you will, um, the probability that you find the key after n attempts is n divided by two to the power k. So as soon as you um, find the key, you can distinguish. Because then you, know you have the full, access to the full spec and you can predict all possible outputs. So that's corresponding to exhaustive key search. This is a limit to exhaustive key search that we said, yeah, if the key, the key is too long, there can be bad stuff happening. And we kind of estimated this to 192. So this is based on cryptanalysis. And this is uh, the expression in the data complexity where normally you got here typically a quadratic term, but we think with our analysis that we can afford a linear term, but with a higher denominator. So this is not something we can prove, but we have a motivation why we believe this cannot be broken. But if, if you have an attacker, well, a cryptanalyst should try to find an attack that allows you to, uh, that allows to distinguish 
this from a random oracle, and with success probability higher than this, given M and N resources. So has there been cryptanalysis? Yeah, we are looking at it, but also some groups have looked at it, but not so many. So I would really welcome cryptanalysis. Let's take a look at the performance of Zoof. So the performance of Zoof is basically this thing where you present input and you get output. This is mask derivation, this thing. Um, okay. So mask derivation on ARM Cortex M0, so that's kind of the low end CPU, it's still 32 bit CPU, but still quite, quite cheap. And it's used a lot in uh, low end uh, in IoT devices or on uh, low end smart cameras. So Zoof mass derivation costs 1985 cents on ARM Cortex M0. If you process less than 48 bytes, that's less than 384 bits. Well, actually less than, yeah, less than 384 bits. Yeah. This is the amount of cycles. Yeah. That's basically when you have single block input, single block output. Well, it's not, doesn't say much. If you look at Mac computation for um, long inputs, then you're basically doing here a lot of computation here and here only one block yeah, because it's a short output. If you do stream generation for a long output, you do a lot of this computation and few of these. So they have kind of the same, more or less the same performance. Actually, this is a bit heavier to do long inputs than to do long outputs per byte. Yeah, so this is cycles per byte of input, cycles per byte of output. 25, 26 cycles per byte. So if we compare to something uh, that has the same functionality, well, AES 128 in counter mode also generates a stream that costs 121.4 cycles per byte. So that's almost five times as slow. Yeah? So this thing is five times as fast as AES on ARM Cortex M0. If you look at um, Cortex M3 and 4, well, you see the numbers are kind of divided by a factor. And here for long input, you only have 8.8 .8 cycles per byte and 8.1 cycles. Also AES gets faster, but the ratio still more than, well, about one in four. But it's still four times as fast, more or less, on ARM Cortex M3. So on these low end CPUs, get much faster than AES. Now let's take a look at the high-end CPUs. Well, Intel Core i5, 6,500, uh, Skylake CPU. Uh, when we do it on a single core, and uh, yeah, apparently that's a setting we have to disable the Turbo Boost for honest comparison. Um, we make use of the SMD instructions operating on 256 bits. So we see here, that we get quite much better performances than um, uh, Cortex because of course it's a much more powerful CPU and we fall below one cycle per byte. Yeah. But AES falls actually at let's say two thirds of a cycle per byte. But AES here has a uh, dedicated AES instructions. So this is really not fair. We are comparing here Zoof with <clears throat> general purpose instructions, well, at least SIMD, if you can call them general purpose, they are not designed for Zoof, with an instruction that does AES and just that. But what you see is that despite the fact that AES has dedicated instructions, we reach performance in the same order of magnitude. So that's, I think, quite, that was quite, uh, we were very happy when we got this performance. And even happier later when the successor of the Skylake, the Skylake X appeared, where we basically get faster than AES. Yeah? Because it has a 512-bit SIMD, which is more powerful. So we can make more use. So we actually are faster than AES on a platform that has dedicated AES instructions. So it's quite fast. Okay, so that's actually uh, my talk. So um, I will conclude and then there's probably some time for questions. Huh?
So I think uh, I would like to conclude from this that secure DAC functions are powerful, that you can do a lot of it of symmetric crypto with it. I, so, I showed you stream encryption. I showed you MAC functions. I showed you nonce-based authenticated encryption, uh, session or no session. Um, also, this deterministic authenticated encryption, or called SIV-based authentic encryption, the form of the Y block cipher, but there's also other modes that we have for that. Um, yeah, this Y block encryption. Um, so I showed you that DEC functions can be built from permutations. Probably there are other ways, but we prefer to do that from permutations. If you want something compact and um, easier to protect against DPA and stuff, we uh, would recommend key duplex now, yeah, full state. Well, because in the beginning we did not absorb over the complete state. In parallel, we have Farfalle to offer. And if you look at Zudu, it gives a very competitive deck function. Zudu. Uh, okay, thanks for your attention. So I would like to um, announce something. So if you want to be part of this search, because it's not finished yet, we're still trying to improve and gain understanding. So we have open positions. <clears throat> in our uh, group, three open positions, one more on crypto analysis, one on provable security, and one on um, crypto engineering, so investigation of side channel attacks and fault attacks. Um, and you can find it on uh, ICR um, uh, website. So you can send a mail. Um, I think you have to apply to, to our secretaries, which you can always, if you want more information, send the mail to me, Leila, or Bachman, which you can find all the information on the ICR uh, job posting. So look for uh, Radboud. So thanks for your attention. Uh, for, first of all, th thanks, thank you, uh, you know, like Professor uh, John for a excellent talk uh, on a very interesting primitive. So it brings forth, I guess, a lot of interesting ideas among the audience. So I would request the audience uh, also to, you know, like, please feel free to ask uh, questions. Uh, maybe on the zoom box or you know like um, yeah i think uh, there is a lot of appreciation from the audience that we can see so i guess the talk was really really eng engaging um, are there any questions from the audience okay so there is one question. It says like, how does the uh, Zodo performance compare to SHA-3, Shake, and Salsa-based crypto? Yeah. Um, so uh, Shake and um, SHA-3. So if you look at these low-end CPUs, it's not really well suited because it has a huge state. Huh? So Shake and SHA-3 have a huge state. Also, Shake and Shatri, they, sh they suffer from um, um, overly uh, conservative number of rounds. So that happened in the, um, in the Shatri competition. At some point, we increased the rounds to 24, while now we think that 12 rounds would give a huge margin still. Uh, so that, in that respect, it's really favorable if you compare it to Shake. Now, if you compare to, what is it, Chacha, uh, then I think Chacha is quite efficient. <clears throat> but um, so it depends also on the number of rounds, of course. Huh? So we think with um, uh, Zoof, so what we should compare is Zoof and Chacha. So Zoof in, uh, with a long output and Chacha as a stream cipher, because Chacha is a stream cipher. And if you look at um, Chacha, uh, with uh, 12 rounds, then, yeah, I don't know. We, did, we never did actually the test, but I think Zoof would beat it. If you took a cha-cha with eight rounds, Zoof would not beat it. I don't think it would beat it. But with eight rounds, it would beat it on many platforms. Uh, but uh, we should do the test. I think there should be some kind of benchmark that we can uh, compare. So there is uh, one more question which talks about like, <clears throat> so uh, like how do you develop like like if you want to develop SCA countermeasures, then uh, do you do you suggest to have masking and as a protection? Yes. So there's <clears throat> in countermeasures, huh, there's 
several things you can do. Uh, you can do uh, countermeasures at the algorithmic level. So say, yeah, we're going to do masking. We're going to do our pseudo permutation. And we're going to do it like in three shares, for instance. Uh, because we have only degree two, it's quite uh, well suited for that, of course. Huh? We, we do, did that did on purpose. So if you have to do it with cha-cha, it's not so easy. But it's good, it's easy. But it's always expensive. So if you have three shares, you kind of blow up uh, always uh, the the state size by a big factor, by a factor of three at least. Mm -hmm. And also the computation uh, goes times four or five or six even. Mm -hmm. Because all nonlinear operations, it's, it's, it's growing as a square. Right? So if you have um, an AND gate, uh, if three share, you get nine AND gates. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite costly. So that's one thing you can do, masking, if you have no other choice. The other thing you can do is at mode level, build all kinds of uh, countermeasures. So uh, it's more like leakage resilient cryptography uh, kind of approach where you try to limit the number of times a key is used. So let's say you got, um, uh, you do TLS or something like that. Now I do some session. You set up a key with um, uh, ECDH or so, or with some post quantum thing. And then you, what you can actually do is let this key evolve with the ratchet uh, forward. And every time um, you basically use the, use the key only once. Uh, that gives uh, no problems at sending side because uh, you can afford that. And this key will form a moving target. And if you never get back to the same key, you cannot do a differential uh, DPA attack. Mm -hmm. But at receiving end, you can get, um, you have to protect against. Uh, um, how do you call it? Uh, denial of service attacks and so on. So if your uh, adversary is going to flip some bits, then uh, at receiving end, you have to take countermeasures. So there's some engineering there where you have to limit the number of times you use a key, uh, that the number of times you start the computation from the same point. Um, uh, so the more you can do that, the more robust you are. But the more you can do that, also the more you get a possibility of a DPA. Huh? There's a kind of a compromise to be made. And then there are, uh, this is a, a problem, especially for memory encryption, because for memory encryption, you want to encrypt and you want to be able to decrypt much later on different moments. So you cannot do that. You cannot put these limits. And in that case, there have been modes developed, especially for that purpose. And one of these modes is ISAP. That's one of the um, submissions to the NIST um, lightweight competition. So it's a solution that is fully at mode level and you can plug in any permutation. So the idea is that you don't have to actually do masking. And uh, there's uh, only one mode uh, that I now mention, ISAP, but there uh, are probably other designs that do the same. So um, as far as masking is concerned, of course, this low degree is an advantage, but you cannot expect miracles. It will always be expensive. Yeah. Um, as far as leakage resilience is concerned, for many use cases like point-to-point -point encryption, you can actually do very efficient stuff with Zodiac, for instance. In Zodiac, we have really built in uh, a number of um, mechanisms to, uh, to make DPA difficult. Same for... Um, differential uh, fault attacks, you can have to avoid that you do two times the computation with the same key. Yeah. If you want to protect against CIFA and so on, up to now, um, if you cannot strongly limit the number of times you use a key, then the method um, that uh, I investigated together with the, the people from EIK, huh? so it's not the Brownish at all, um, what you can do is combine uh, masking, so threshold scheme, for instance, with um, redundant computation. Uh, and it helps then if you encode your function by only invertible functions. So that allows to, to get provable protection against single fault DFA, a uh, single fault CIFA. But of course, in CIFA, you're not limited to a single fault. So it's, that's really ongoing work. But just to say, and uh, that's protection um, at masking level is very hard for ARX things like cha cha, of course. And so that's here an advantage, and it's also even much better uh, these functions of algebraic degree two than AES, where the 
nonlinear mapping as a high algebraic degree. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so I think there is a Lila provides a reference to the ICR jobs. Okay, so so uh, so one quick question is like uh, you know so you you talked about efficient software implementations right on different platforms for this yeah. more uh, mechanism. So usually when we see like AES software implementations, they use a lot of table lookups right in their implementation. Yeah. So what what is like that you like you have you know in your implementations for example is it like similar kind of things or the implementation is more bitwise you know like uh... yeah i will show you the pseudo code so um you can see what it is these are basically three words uh beta so these are the words for the cpu words so now eight bits sorry it's eight bit cpu words but they're actually 32 bit cpu words yeah and for instance, <clears throat> the end of two planes is just the end of words. The, XOR, uh, the, the addition of two planes is just the, the XOR of words. And uh, uh, shifts, so cyclic shifts, is just cyclic shifts of words. So there is no table lookup at all. It's all uh, bitwise operations. Yeah. Yeah. So there are no uh, cache attacks are not a threat at all. Uh, especially not if all your state fits in the register, of course, mm -hmm. if it's in the register. So uh, you can see all these operations, this dot, this bitwise n, this bitwise xr, and these are just cyclic shifts. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, so just asking, like, are the software cores of this, the sudo and so on, are they available online? I mean, maybe... yeah, they're all in GitHub. Huh? So you have the, um, the oh, XKCP. Mm -hmm. uh, let me quickly uh, see if I can. Find it. Uh, like um, let me see. I'm trying to find my browser. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, it's very slow. Yep. There's all the code. Huh? Okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. To be honest, it's Gilles that really uh, made all of this and manages all of this. Lit. Low. But there you see Zudu, Ketchup P. It's, um, yeah, it's well documented and it has a lot of things. So it also has all the modes and stuff. So for instance, uh, hi. There you get Zodiac, Zoof. Catch a catch a kangaroo 12. So everything is there. Um, and it has a sponge construction. That's actually everything you would ever need. That's kind of the idea. So all this code that is that I report on, this code is actually in there. Mm -hmm. And the code that runs fast on uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Cortex M0 and 3 and 4. It's all there. It's also, yeah, I should mention, I never, I didn't really write any of this code. Most of this code is written by uh, Ronnie Van Keer and also some parts by Gilles. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's, an, you know, like, uh, let's talk again, you know, like on behalf of the conference organizers, I would like to thank Yuan for this excellent talk. And it was extremely enriching for most of us. And, and I believe that the audience, I mean, I, I can already see there are a lot of positive feedbacks from the audience. So I would like to say, you know, like a warm thanks to Yuan. I know it's also getting late over there. So with this, with this, yeah, so with this, I would like to say, you know, like uh, uh, goodbye. And I think uh, I will leave the dais now to the program chairs, uh, Stefan and uh, Lala mm -hmm. and other persons. So, uh, there was a question about differential attack. So, okay, so maybe I missed it. Okay, so yeah, it's probably in the Slack. Let me just have it. Yeah, I'll take it offline. Huh? Maybe you can just post it offline to you on and, uh, and, and, and I believe you can get that response. So thank you, Yon. I mean, it was a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thank you very much. 
it was my pleasure to do it. And, uh, I hope I didn't bore you. <laughs> no, it was excellent. So I, we, we would probably bother you with more queries subsequently when we get into the stuff. A little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So my next, Stefan, would like to. Sure. Um. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan, for for excellent talk. Um, always pleasure listening. Uh, yeah, with this, we 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 are done for for today, and that means people uh, get some rest. And tomorrow we continue with one more tutorial, and then we start with with the conference and posters and keynotes and a lot of things happening during the weekend. Thank you all for being here. My neck. Yep. Thank you all. And thanks a lot, Joan, for that excellent talk. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, tomorrow. And tomorrow, the main conference will start with a lot of activities going on for the next two days. So stay tuned. And uh, see you tomorrow.